This episode is brought to you by Circle, the issuer of USDC, which hopefully, as you all know, is the preferred stablecoin of digital natives and crypto natives with over 1.5 million holders globally. You'll hear more about USDC later in the show. All right, everyone, welcome back to another episode of Empire. You got me, Yano, hosting solo. We have Michelle Bailey Fraden, a partner at Sequoia, uh, coming on the show to talk all things crypto investing. So, uh, Michelle, welcome to Empire. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, of course. Excited to have you here. I want to um, start with this like 30,000 foot framework, right? Because you wrote this piece uh, back in, I think it was December of 2021 that I loved. It was called Ask Not When Moon, Ask Why Moon. And uh, I just thought it'd be helpful to start with this like big framework that you guys had and really that you had. Uh, and, and maybe it'd be helpful for you to just outline your thesis and like your ideas that you wrote about in that piece. And then what I want to get into after that is like, do those, do those, does that framework kind of still hold true today? But maybe we can start with that first question first. Can you just outline that piece for us? Yeah, sure. So yeah, that's um, what we published in, in December, 2021 was a thesis that we had been investing off of at Sequoia for quite some time. And it was a, a team effort. There's a lot of Sequoia fintech crypto consumer enterprise experience. And so actually when we look at crypto as a partnership, we see elements of a lot of those different trends. And so when we think about crypto, we think about it really holistically and have this framework that's very similar to a typical quote unquote stack, you know, hardware up through software. And so when we were thinking about how to organize the universe of crypto, we, we used that framework. And so the way we think about it is you can, you can even start at the hardware layer, right? Your, your uh, GPUs, <laughs> TPUs, whatever you're, you're mining on, obviously that's shifting a bit, but you still need some hardware doing, doing compute. Uh, and then above that, you have your core uh, compute and storage and the layer one blockchain. So your Bitcoin, Ethereum, Solana, Avalanche, et cetera, on and on. Uh, and then above that, you get your layer twos, which are the scaling solutions. Most of those have been built around Ethereum, trying to scale Ethereum, but increasingly, there are more, you've got your, you know, ZK proof companies, Starkware, which Sequoia works with. Uh, there's also some optimistic roll-up attempts at that. Polygon, which Sequoia India works with, that's, you know, pursuing a range of approaches, trying to make Ethereum work faster. Above that, you have what we kind of call the data layer. This is where there is a lot of movement in terms of how this will evolve. But this is where I put things like, interoperability, so what people typically call bridges, but messaging layers. So we work with layer zero in this layer, as well as things like oracles, chain link, uh, others, depending on the, the chain, um, and even some other solutions that are trying to work on the problem of getting data in and out of the blockchain from non-crypto applications. And so that's a, another really interesting problem space that more people are working in. Then above that, that's kind of the core infrastructure. You get the application layer. And so we think about it in terms of centralized exchanges, DeFi, payments, NFTs, gaming, and there'll be social, right? Other Web3 applications. There'll be more and more of these exploding over time. Those are the most obvious categories where we've seen a lot of innovation and the use case, the, the core mechanism of crypto really lends itself well to that. And then... Plugging into all that, you have, well, how do people access this world? You have really roughly institutional or enterprise infrastructure for that in consumer. So the consumer would do things like wallets, uh, your, your MetaMask, Rainbow, Phantom, et cetera, and, you know, Backpack, uh, my friend Armani and Tristan are working on that. And then you have the institutional ways of accessing and running that, things like Fireblocks or institutional custody, which we work with, um, and fraud solutions, many others. So that's how we divide up the crypto world and and think about it, inspired by a lot of other layers of tech history and, and fintech history as well. Yeah. I mean, let's talk about that history for a sec, because one thing I really wanted to get your take on, like when I think Sequoia, I think like probably the most storied VC firm of all time, like Don Valentin, like what, probably 50 billion under man. I'm making this number up 50 billion, 80 billion, somewhere around the 50 to hundred billion AUM, like super rough range there, but like just basically a massive VC firm, incredible amount of success, Apple, Cisco, Google, Instagram, like 
PayPal, LinkedIn, Reddit, Tumblr, WhatsApp, Zoom, like the list goes on, like very storied firm. There's this piece by Joel Manigro um, at Placeholder back in 2015, just talking about like fat protocol versus fat, uh, the, the fat protocol thesis, right? And so like when you think about Web2 yeah. and a lot of the investments you guys have done, uh, it's it's the fat app thesis, right? So you've got these like layers of the internet, HTTP, like SMTP, and then you have apps that were built on top of them. And the, the value didn't accrue to the protocol, it accrued to the apps. Joel's thesis yep. in 20, when, when did, 2015, I want to say, was um, that the value in crypto would accrue to the protocol. And so you have the tokens of the protocols, the Sol and ETH and AVAX and things like that. Um, and we've we've kind of seen that, but like kind of haven't really seen some of that actually as well. So I'm just curious, like how you, what is your current thesis for like crypto investing as it relates to the FAT protocol thesis? It depends on what time frame you're looking at it. So what's interesting is when you look at the history of tech investing, the early companies that were the most successful that Sequoia worked with are mostly at the core infrastructure layer, or they were at hardware companies, right? Apple early on, or they were networking companies, Cisco, right? It took a long time for the application layer or to infrastructure layer to get to a good enough place that you could actually onboard hundreds of millions, billions of people scale things like Google and beyond to the point where then you could even get things like PayPal and mm. Airbnb and WhatsApp and all these other things. So the thing is, it just depends on the time horizon. I think just because of the logic of how things are built, you know, it's not actually very different than building a building, right? You need the foundation before you can build anything else on top of it. And so I think for right now, the there's significantly more value in the infrastructure layer. But I think that's just because there are so many problems with building and scaling on blockchains that that is not necessarily always true. And that over time, it's possible, as we've seen in the rest of technology history, that in the longest time frame, if you give it 50 years, more value will accrue to the application layer than the infrastructure layer. Yeah, that's really interesting. It's... um. I, I think I think this was this was your guys' post as well. The ask not when moon, but why moon. When you had the three phases, right? It was like phase one was like crypto as yeah. an island, very disconnected. Phase two is connectivity, like bridging crypto to the non-crypto world, which maybe you're just starting to see with like Maker, real world assets, like that very early days. It's funny. I feel like um, I like I like I have bad taste in my mouth from real world assets from like the 2017 like token, <laughs> tokenized real estate. You remember like all the like yeah. tokenized real estate pitches, and then uh. Phase, yep. three, phase three is maturation, right? Like this fusion of crypto and non-crypto. How does your investing thesis, like it, that, it basically means then there's two phases of investing for you. Like first you have to figure out, all right, what part of the, what part of the, uh, what, what phase are we in? Like what, where are we on the timeline? And then, okay, how does that determine my, do I invest in the app layer versus the infrastructure layer? So like, how do you, how do you view things right now? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, yeah, so I think, Maybe I'll answer in two ways. In terms of the phases, when we were sharing that, this idea of first cryptos being built very separate from any other, you know, linkage to the financial system or anything else, right? There's no port over your bank balance from Chase into, right? Everything is net new. It's not connected to the rest of the financial system. Fiat on off ramps are still pretty buggy in a lot of areas. And so it's building its own world. And so part of that is very advantageous for crypto founders. For instance, if I have a lot of crypto assets in a MetaMask wallet, I cannot easily use that to get a loan on something, right? And so then you have things like Aave and Compound involved because they are their own universe. And there are a lot of examples of this in financial history where these pockets of innovation were built, incumbents were not serving that. And so that actually made more room for more founders to build native services to serve that market. And so that's really the phase we're in. I, I think we're so early to use the trope, but you know, it's still in phase one. We are just getting into the connectivity phase where people are, and a lot of that has to do with regulatory blockers, right? Where we're waiting for clarity, but people are trying to build more and more connections so that the crypto world and the non-crypto world can be more connected. And it doesn't always mean real world assets. It can also mean just, you know, being able to move money directly from my Venmo account into my MetaMask wallet, et cetera. Right? Right. Like 
just more fluidity or even between data. You know, I want to bring my friends from another social app into my friends in this app, right? Right right now, there's no connectivity like that. It's completely separate. I want to bring my NFTs into my Instagram, right? You can't do any of that today. They're just totally separate worlds. But once the infrastructure layer is built, we have more connectivity that will allow more data flow, more asset flow. Then when you, when you think about maturity is when I think you can actually see really huge applications. That's when we can get the TikTok scale, you know, Instagram, YouTube scale applications in crypto. And so a lot of people just keep saying, oh, they're not here yet. They're not here yet. And if you look at tech history, it takes a long time. <laughs> that, I mean, those are, that was 20 years into for some of those, into the history of, of the internet or more. So it just takes time to solve a lot of these core problems. Um, and in throughout all of those periods, it doesn't mean that it wasn't worth investing in it actually to your, to your original question, it just is about the timing of when is the right time to invest in certain things. And it's not perfect because there were still applications, you know, Yahoo is a great example of a, of an earlier application in the history of the internet, right. Which was, you know, still did very well. Obviously, when you look at the scale of what we're able to reach today with billion, 4 billion people online, it's very different, but it doesn't. So it's not perfect. I think it just informs my strategy that the bigger problems tend to be core pieces of the crypto stack that we need to solve before applications can get massive. There are still some founders building applications that we'd like to work with now. But we also adjust our expectations that you physically cannot scale something built in crypto right now to 4 billion people overnight in the way that if you build it in Web 2, that might be the expectation. Why don't we have you know hundreds of millions of users at this many years in? Here, you have to have a different expectation just because of the limitations of where we are with the stack. Yeah. No, I think that's a good reminder, right? Like TCP was... When was that built? Like 1974 or something. And then you didn't get Netscape yes. Netscape until 20 years later, right? 1994. So like that's a 20 year period where we've got these like, like ritzy ditzy, like little protocols, but like nothing's getting built on top of them. So it's a good, it's a good reminder. Um, yeah. And, and you can look back and think, oh, what was everyone doing all that time? Well, it's a lot of work actually yeah, to, yeah. Solve, <laughs> to solve those problems yeah. and to connect the whole network and get everyone online and make broadband better and all that stuff. Right. And we're at an advantage now where there's more internet connectivity, but like scaling blockchains is really hard. There's really hard math. It's super yeah. hard computing problem. If you talk to people at the core protocols, I mean, they've got some of the smartest mathematicians and people in the world working on this stuff because it's so fascinating. So people are working really hard on it. It's just going to take some time and deserve some patience. Yeah. Uh, there's a piece by Union Square Ventures. Uh, I think it was Nick Grossman and Danny Grant who wrote it in like 2018 called The Myth of the Infrastructure Phase. But the, the, the piece kind of outlines like you build apps and then infrastructure and then apps and then infrastructure. I'm just curious, like, and, and it's actually much, that, I'll, I'll link in the show notes that does not do it justice. Um, but actually, I think the, I mean, I think the piece, they used the, they used electricity as an example. I haven't read the piece in years, but I think one of the things was like, you didn't need an electricity network before you could have light. Like it was actually the apps drove the infrastructure. Uh, I think a lot, I think their, their argument was like, everyone says you need infrastructure to get the apps. But really, if you look at kind of history, there's a lot of times when you, when the apps pull forward the infrastructure, if that makes sense. I, I honestly, I'm probably botching it. I need to reread the piece, but I'm, I, I'm just. I, I get yeah. what you're saying. Yeah. So I guess here's the way I would think about it is I totally agree. Innovation doesn't happen in a straight line. It's never organized. It's an ecosystem, right? Yeah. There's tons of mutations and things evolving and adaptations that work and don't and things succeed and die and reproduce and et cetera. So it's a lot more like biology when you zoom out, but so it doesn't go in a straight line. So there's absolutely applications and infrastructure being built all at the same time. I think the, the important thing for us in terms of investing and supporting founders building these businesses though, is that if you are building you know, the light bulb in an era when not everyone has electricity, you should not expect the light bulb to sell to billions of people overnight, right? You have to have the right mindset. And also that means for you as a founder, you have to run the business differently. We're like because, mass adoption today. Like, I, yeah, I see what you're saying. Right. Where we're, a lot of people are conditioned to, you know, insane growth paths or other things because of the web two era that has a much steeper infrastructure layer that's you know much more mature and so 
part of it is, is yes, we will have some applications and then we'll have some infrastructure layer, but it's, and I agree that sometimes those applications are the reason that there is energy and excitement to improve the infrastructure, right? If you don't, that's why a lot of people are saying, why bother with crypto, you know, at all? What is it good for? What are the app killer apps? Well, it's this kind of chicken and egg problem where it's, if you talk to a lot of developers building on it, there's a bunch of bugs and issues they run into and challenge with it. So there, it's not going to feel as fluid and perfect as what we're used to today until those get solved. And it's and it goes in this kind of tension and fits and starts. So I agree that applications are can emerge, and we're starting to see more and more. Uh, and those help draw energy for, so that other founders and other builders feel it's worth it to build infrastructure. Okay, there's going to be something built on top of this, you know, core foundation that I'm building. But I think it's important for a lot of people who keep criticizing crypto or maybe waiting for why isn't it better? Why isn't it smoother yet to understand that there is just a lot of work that needs to be done that people are doing to get there, but it doesn't mean it won't. And that the time horizons for these things can sometimes be a lot longer than people really recognize. Yeah. I know you guys made a, um, a big investment in layer zero is actually the reason we're doing this podcast, Brian, we had Brian come on the podcast and I said, who's the most impactful, most helpful VC that you have ever worked with. And he said you. So that was why, that's why we're doing this episode, actually. And I, that just reminded me. Um, he had some fun well, stories. that's very nice of you and very nice of Brian. <laughs> Sean and I work with Brian and the Layer Zero team and we love them yeah. and try to work with He had very good things to say about Sequoia. Yeah, I think he had some stories of you guys pulling all-nighters with him um, or something along those lines. So that's... Uh... I definitely have a few... <laughs> You all letters on your belt. A nice. few notches related to layer zero. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> took some, layer zero and Brian took some years off your life. No, I'm curious. Um, I want to just get your take on like where, so, so it feels like we're like maybe ending phase one, going into phase two. Where, where are you guys investing right now? I know you did layer zero. I, I don't know much about your other crypto deals, but I'd love to just hear like your current investment thesis and like app layer and infrastructure layer, data layer, NFTs, wallets. Like where, where are you investing? Yeah. The answer is all of the above. So we meet with companies in all of those areas all day long. Uh, and we try to stay humble at Sequoia. And so we do have theses and we have areas where we spend more time and work, but we also would never put ourselves above the founders who are, you know, find a good problem and feel like now is the time to build something. And so we stay also open-minded to what the smartest people we meet want to build even if it doesn't immediately fit our thesis. I don't think we're so confident that we can sit in our you know, little ivory tower and perfectly imagine everything that should be built. And so it's a give and take, right? Between yeah. what we think and we're looking for, as well as what founders say, hey, no, I, I think this is the, the time. Um, I would say we have worked with a lot of companies that are working on infrastructure problems. So, uh, right, Starkware, Polygon, out of our India team, uh, layer zero, as well as many others, several in stealth. There are a couple of companies working on privacy, which is a really interesting challenge um, and more. And, and obviously fireblocks, et cetera. And then, but we still meet a lot of companies that are uh, trying to build different applications and whether that's gaming or NFTs or, you know, modern uses of, NFTs for some of the use cases we've talked a lot about for a long time, but no one's actually built yet. Uh, so we invest everywhere, uh, but it, it's a give and take between our thesis and what the founders would need to come up with. You, you had this great thread in May um, when like everything was kind of imploding. And one part of the thread, uh, I'm just going to read it. It said, recognize that the funding environment has changed. VC funding is no longer on tap. Control expenses accordingly. Several crypto funds were just raised, so it's possible crypto does better than tech, but it's also possible it doesn't. It's not your fault, but it is your problem. What's the state of crypto VC funding right now? Like, how are we still down or is it like top, bottomed and it's kind of coming back up? Like, where are we? Well, first, I have to give credit for the it's not your fault, but it is your problem line to my partner, Ravi Gupta, who reminds me that I should have given him an it's, HT. It's a nice line. Quote. It's a, it's a nice line. It is. Yeah. So that is Ravi's <laughs> line. I shamelessly stole. I did cite him and all the other partners as Koya in the <laughs> bottom of that thread, but he would like specific credit for that. So there you go, Ravi. Um, I think, yeah. So here's the funny thing. This is, this is Michelle's personal view. 
So, and we've seen it in, in a lot of the data. I think if you're below 500 million raises, so your series A's, your C's, your A's, your early series B's, the letters don't really make sense, but that roughly tracks to it. I think there's still market for that. And, and people are holding companies to an even higher standard, but we can see great founders. We've been investing very actively throughout this whole period at Sequoia. Uh, we see other companies that are still getting funded in those ranges. I think a, a, but above 500 million and a billion, the market is really quiet. And that's because if you think about a lot of VC returns, whether it's crypto or otherwise, to, you know, you have power law dynamic where you need a couple of companies to generate the vast majority of returns. So you need to believe that they can, you know, 10x or more in terms of the actual TEV, not just revenue, right, but the, but the enterprise value or the market cap of the company. And what's happening is a lot of people are looking at public markets and saying, okay, that company that, that I'm comparing it to in my head is only trading at 5 billion. And so if I invest in this one at two, right, I don't have much of a return. And there's a lot of examples like that. And so, whereas two years ago, when interest rates were nearly zero, 5 trillion extra stimulus money was pumped into the economy, uh, some digital transformation was pulled forward dramatically because of our shift to, to, you know, remote work in the world. And so tech stocks went nuts. People could, were some people, not everyone, and a lot of people talk about writing, underwriting to long-term multiples, but some people are investing, looking at the highest of the high comp. And now when those comps have changed, it's people are a little bit more scared to underwrite those higher checks. And so I think the later stage market is a lot harder. Um, I think there are some companies where you look at the last mark and it's, on par to publicly traded companies with a hundred times their revenue scale and probably profitable. And so as an investor, you, it, you're not investing your own money. Usually you're investing in other people's money. And so you have to be honest and say, you know, as much as I love this company or I love this founder, I can't really justify doing that when I, when this, there are so many other opportunities that we think are a better risk reward profile. And so that's, what's happening at the later stages. Crypto is a little bit different because there is more, even more dry powder, um, that's been earmarked specifically for crypto. And so I do think you're seeing some rounds, but it, it's really only at the layer one stage where you can still, if you believe, oh, maybe it will be the next Ethereum or Solana, you know, underwrite something a little higher. But other than that, I think um, our advice to all founders has been to be really focused on either getting to profitability much sooner than later so that you can fund the business yourself and you're not reliant on, what other people think and their mood at the time, uh, or or you know making other choices accordingly because the until the market picks back up again. All right, everyone. Time for a quick word from Circle and USDC. As a crypto user, you know the power of stable coins, dollar digital currencies that transcend borders, banking hours and legacy financial rails. Well, Circle's USDC has quickly become one of the most trusted and widely used stable coins. It's simple. People use USDC because of its composability, its stability, and its reserve transparency. And USDC isn't just adopted by a few of us DeFi DGENs and DAOs and NFT marketplaces, crypto companies alike, they all leverage USDC to diversify their treasury, asset management, and ecosystem-wide composability. The adoption's clear. USDC has grown to more than $50 billion in circulation since launching in 2018. We all have and we all will continue to take shots on our favorite volatile crypto assets, obviously, but USDC is one of the easiest ways to store your funds in a stable asset that can be used to send value around the world almost instantly. It lowers the cost of cross-border payments. It integrates into the growing ecosystem of crypto apps. As a seamless, trusted dollar digital currency, USDC is a zero to one opportunity for the financial system. If you want to learn more about USDC, I would recommend you check out the recently published Transparency Hub on circle.com. It's a great update to Circle's content on USDC. It outlines everything from links to their weekly reserve reports, monthly attestations, blog posts that are written by their exec team that highlight how and why USDC was built the way it is. Really recommend it. Just go to circle.com backslash transparency to access it. Now, let's get back to the show.
let's say a founder comes to you and they're like series A or something or, or their seed and you're looking at metrics. Like if you're a web, if you're a SaaS company, you're looking at like, looking at like CAC and like uh, net revenue retention and like LT, like you, you, you have these like SaaS metrics that are like tried and true and everyone uses those to compare different SaaS, SaaS businesses. What are the metrics that you guys care about in crypto? Yeah. So at Seed, sometimes we back founders before they even have a product. Yeah. So, and, and there have been a lot of examples of this Stripe we backed before there was the product that is Stripe, right? So, um, not, a, not a bad investment. <laughs> no, they're amazing. <laughs> uh, so Seed is, is different in that what I look for and what a lot of people look for is Seed is heavily about the person. Yeah. And so is there, what I call it for myself is, is there examples of personal alpha? Can I look at your background and track record and see that you've made the most of every situation that you've been in? You've played every hand you've been dealt to the highest potential outcome. Um, and that they have a unique view on the market and a, you know, a unique business idea. At A and later, in terms of what are the metrics that are important for crypto, it really depends on the business. So we talked about at the beginning, that whole framework. When I'm working with Fireblocks, Fireblocks is a SaaS business. So I can look at it the way that you would any other SaaS business. Uh, if you look at layer zero, it's an infrastructure layer that's also about adoption. And so you can look at things like uh, number of transactions or messages sent. You can look at ubiquity as the key metric for the business to think about a networks effects business where eventually you want you know everyone to be using this infrastructure layer, this messaging layer to, to solve that problem. For FTX, it's all about market share because the volumes of crypto trading go up and down all the time. But if FTX is continuing to win market share, even if the volume is you know, secularly going up and down and they can't control that, then you know the business is still continuing to improve. So it really, and then for you know DeFi protocols or maybe some NFT, we look a lot at users. It's just like any other consumer business in a way where what matters is users. What's user retention? How many new users are you gaining? What's their level of activity? Is most of your volume dependent on a very small number of users? That's a problem we've seen with a lot of mm. different businesses that are built where they can look like they have a lot of volumes, but if you zoom in really close, you know, it's 200 whales just I mean, generating that, all I, of that. I will, I will say that's most of DeFi right now, but that's okay. <laughs> It is right now. It, even in the bear market, though, there were some where it was different. Um, but that's harder, right? Because then depending on what stage you're going to work with them or mess at, right? You're basically relying on 200 people to not change their mind and use another application. So that's right. You know, a lot riskier than something with pretty broad base adoption and like a Uniswap or something where actually there's quite a lot of, of users as well who use it in, in some regular frequency. So it depends on the on the business and on on what the most important future driver of success is to care, you know, to, to de detect what that metric should be. Like one thing you saw in DeFi summer or, or even like this kind of kicked off in DeFi summer was liquidity mining uh, and using your yes. token as in, an incentive to get users in. And then what happened is people realized it was just kind of mercenary capital coming in for the yields. Uh, and that they would, they didn't actually care about the, the project or the protocol or the app or the whatever it was. Like they didn't really care about it at all. They just wanted the yields and they wanted the tokens and that they they basically leave. And so then what you saw was like kind of different ways to like capture that, but it none, none of the, and to like retain people. But again, they were, they were retaining people because they were getting tokens, not because the product was amazing. Like, how do you guys think about uh, just this idea of like giving equity essentially to incentivize founders <laughs> or uh, excuse me to incentivize yeah. to incentivize users yeah yeah well it's a whole other conversation about whether it's equity or not i think in a lot of cases it's not even if people maybe think about it that way um but uh it's exactly what we've seen for a lot of tech history which is people buying growth yeah and the the thing is you gotta make that investment wisely in the sense that it's you, you know you could use it for any delivery company that's giving you free deliveries or free rides for Uber or whatever, right? We've seen this plenty of times in all sorts of different ways, where a lot of companies have grown to large scales because they have it's all basically built in as CAC. It's all just you know customer acquisition, and so you can give it as a discount. You can falsely lower the price of something so that more people will use it, and then they'll get 
used to using it and then you can raise the prices over time, which is why my Uber rides in San Francisco have gone from $4 to $20 now, right? Yeah. Uh, or you can make that very explicit. You can give people you know, discounts or you can give them tokens. The challenge is that you do that investment wisely. So if you're not in control and you're not actually seeing an ROI from doing it, then you should stop and you should figure out how you can actually have product market fit. Otherwise, you're just going to be burning resources for no reason. And so if you're doing all of that and you're sending tokens or cash or whatever it is out the door and none of those users are sticking around or bringing in new users, then the LTV is not there. And then you should really turn off that experiment as fast as possible. Mm and work on, okay, how can we get users to like us without paying them to like us, <laughs> Yeah, which is hard. Yeah. And so that's the thing is that there's a lot yeah. of people who think they have product market fit because they have incredible volume growth, but you're paying for all of that. And so if you turned it off and you saw what would we be like if we didn't do that, you'd see your real product market fit. A great example of this, because companies are usually really afraid to do this, right? But some companies that have been forced to do it, it's actually been good for them. So Airbnb used to spend a ton of money on sales and marketing. The pandemic hit, no one's traveling in the entire world anymore. They basically turned off all marketing and basically nothing happened because they had such a strong brand yeah. at that point yeah. and everyone knew that. Uh, and so the value prop was, yeah. was so good because it's like, yeah, I'd like to have a you know cuter place and I don't want to you know stay in a crappy hotel for the same price and I like cooking or whatever it is, right? So it, that doesn't mean that marketing is a waste. The marketing is important. You need to build that brand, but there are companies who think they are more reliant on it than they are. And when you turn it off, you will see, wow, we really do have product market fit. And there are other companies where you turn it off and you say, oh crap, we don't, but you need to know that yeah, so yeah, that yeah. you can go fix oh, it. It's so interesting. If you, yeah. yeah. Does not bode well for the Airbnb marketing team. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Um, but no, I, I think that's a good point of like the, the Ubers, right? Like Uber and Lyft. Like I remember when I, uh, like in Man, it used to be $5, any Uber in Manhattan, $5. You go anywhere. That ride, the market, that ride in the free market is not $5 though. That is Uber basically give, giving the users free money. Yes. It just looks different than like free money. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So it's all the same. I actually think that's an amazing thing, uh, experiment for founders to do is take some core part of their business and turn off all the marketing and advertising. Like we, we just did this with, um, our main newsletter. Like we, one of the ways that we drive newsletter subscribers is same with how like morning brew or like the hustle or any of these big newsletters does it is Facebook and Instagram ads. Um, and we turned it off completely. And our marketing team was like, oh, we're cutting like 50%. I was like, no, 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 to zero for a whole quarter to see what the, like the natural growth is uh, and to see if we can organically grow it. Uh, and we learned some really interesting things. So I, that's actually just a good recommendation, I think, for, for folks. Yeah, it is it is very true. Even if you're going to turn it back on, you can learn a lot, exactly like you said, from where are users finding us if we don't tell them where to find us? Who are the users? Are they different than we thought about who's finding us organically? Does that tell us we should actually do more marketing to those communities later? You know, so you, I totally agree. Even if it's not a long-term answer, you can get a lot of interesting signal yeah. from just going cold turkey on some of that. Agreed. Um, you had a tweet about Netflix and tied it back to crypto. Uh, you said it'll be interesting to see how many subscription. Uh, so, so for those who don't know, Netflix, very like anti ads, no, we're not, we're never going to do ads. And then, you know, when the market turns, now they're building an ad business. Um, and it's, it's just funny. And like bull markets, everyone hates ads and then bear markets. It's like, oh wait, ads are an amazing way to build a business. It's like, come on people. Um, but you, you said it's going to be interesting to see how many subscription and crypto companies flip to freemium models in the next two years, depending on uh, consumer discretionary spending trends. As much as some malign it, uh, free with ads is one of the best business models if you're solving for earth scale access, which I so agree with that tweet. But I just want to hear your uh, your thesis there. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. I mean, I think I'm a little biased probably from working at Google, too, where the thing is, it it all the business model should depend on what you're solving for. And so as much as people criticize ads, if you want to really make something available to the entire world and make this product that anyone can access and they're not limited by how much money they have, the best way to do that is make it free. And then the only way to build a business around it is to put ads on top, which is how a lot of media has worked. 
And a lot of it is about, we believe that this information is important and a lot of people should have access to it regardless of what they can pay. And so this is how we're going to monetize and it works out for everyone. But in crypto, because of also, you know, being in the last couple of years at the end of this bull market where consumers had a lot of more, a lot more discretionary income, they had more money to spend on subscriptions. You saw this secular shift, even in web two, right? With Netflix towards everything should be a subscription and we hate ads, we're over it. What I think is interesting is now if we head into a different environment, does it flip back, right? Because a lot of those ads supported businesses grew up in after, you know, the dot-com era in periods of recession or great financial crisis. And so when consumers have less discretionary income, they may value a free plus ads business more because they really like to use whatever that service is, but they just, you can't justify paying the extra amount for it. And so what I think is interesting is that crypto has had this ethos, right? Of being so strongly against ads and sharing data, but depending on what you're building in crypto, if you really want people to be able to access something, might some type of advertising be the best way to do that and to grow a user base and get your product you know, to solve the, the problem that you want it to solve? Possibly. I don't know whether people will cross yeah. that threshold, but it's interesting to think about. I, I mean, I'm, I'm with you. I'm, I'm as biased as you can get that we've been able to bootstrap, <laughs> bootstrap Blockworks for five years and never take any venture money because of ads. And that has given us the cash to go build research and data tools. Um, uh, and I, I'm, I'm with you. Also, awesome, by the way, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Um, wh what kind of like crypto businesses would, ch like what's one crypto business uh, that should, that maybe charges money, but should go free and put ads on top of it or like where they could consider that? A lot of the experiments in gaming and social and crypto, mm. I think have been uh, struggling with this question in some way, because in terms of growing users the fastest, the easiest thing would be to make it make participation or getting into the game or into the social network free. But that's really hard to do in crypto. Usually you have to buy some assets. You've got to buy ETH or Sol or the NFT to play it or whatever it is. And there's and sometimes those get really expensive really fast. And so you end up with a very small user base. Maybe that works. Maybe you can monetize the heck out of those small users that the thousand fans thesis, but maybe not. Uh, and maybe a game is or a social network is better with a lot more people. Um, so I do think gaming and social may be one of those areas where people are resistant to, to ads in crypto, but some people may choose the path to say, what I want is to have the biggest network possible and the most engagement. And so I'm going to work on figuring out how to make the entry free and maybe selling sponsored things or, you know, some type of freemium you know, you either you yeah. can remove ads or I get special skins for myself and my game that I can buy a Fortnite model, something else where you're the entry to, to the network is free. And there's some other type of monetization that's waiting for you afterwards versus having this very high bar of payment to enter, especially when we're in a bear market. How active are you guys in governance? Because like, I, I know Andreessen's building a governance team. They're really active, like they, they delegate. Um, like how active are you guys in governance? It really depends on a protocol by protocol basis. It depends on the founders. You know, it's interesting. On crypto Twitter, there's a lot of hype about VCs being involved in different ways. And I, I don't know what the, the right answer is. I, I don't subscribe. I don't think we subscribe to that. There's a clear answer that VCs should even have a role in governance or that they mm. should not. I think it really depends on the founder, the protocol, and that specific community about whether there's any, whether it's appropriate for us to participate or whether it should be something where we're backing the founders and we're there to support them, but that the community who, of the users has a louder voice than the VCs. And so I know people are working on that to your point with delegating or other ways, but I think it's an open question as to what, what's, what's the right way to participate? Because there are a lot of times where I just think, you know, we're not as Sequoia, the core users of this. Yeah. And I don't really want us to have a say on any of this. And there are other times where founders say, hey, you know, please support this governance protocol. We think this is really important. 
upgrade, you know, please write something about why it's important or join in the chat and say this. And so there's a big range, I would say. What's your thesis on just like DAOs in general? Like in, in like maybe rephrasing the question, like five years out is crypto governance and like DAOs, like are they much bigger than they are today? Or is this like an experiment that maybe won't pan out and like we'll go back to more like kind of what looks like quasi centralized companies? This question about how humans should organize themselves is as old as humans themselves, right? The, this idea of should it be democracy, should it be dictatorship? We've asked this question from the micro level about family structure all the way to companies, to organizations, to governments, to countries, right? To United Nations. We have asked this question a million times, a million different ways. We're going to keep asking it. We're always going to try to keep iterating. And we're always going to end up with some fusion where companies, yes, they're run by a CEO, but actually they have a board of directors who is a group of people who is kind of oligarchical or, or like a DAO that is actually, you know, telling them voting, for instance, on what to do. So the thing is, I think, again, there is this weird like tribal uh, habit in crypto where something comes up and it's either that you are always 100% for or always 100% against. We are not at the point of- Decentralize everything or like no doubt. <laughs> or nothing at all, right? Like it's just, it's not a one size fits all solution. They're different tools. And so for some groups, for instance, artist collectives, DAO is definitely the right structure, right? If you look at, uh, there, but there are a bunch of really, and Turin is in a bunch of really interesting DAOs where it's basically collections of artists and other people who support those. And that's how the DAO is formed. And then they try to work together to, you know, attribute resources to help other artists or other things they care about. Great use of DAO. Uh, another use of DAO could be for the future of social media and these town square like applications where we really don't want one person controlling it. There's gonna be a big question though that everyone's avoiding, which is the same problem we have in every other democracy, which is that participation is incredibly low because it's really hard to participate and annoying and cumbersome. And I don't really wanna think about it in my daily life. I have no idea if it's a total pipe dream that we're gonna have some Twitter that's actually decentralized with millions of people who all vote to kick people out or not, or vote on <laughs> censorship policies. Like yeah. we might have like 10% participation rate, right? The thing is, it's all an experiment. I totally appreciate the desire to think about, and I think a lot of the people who are doing some of the best work in crypto, they come at the problems of censorship or centralization from a really deep personal meaning that I respect a lot. If you really look into the backgrounds of people, they're, com they're coming from countries or they have families that are coming from countries where this was a very big problem for them. They personally experienced the pain or they have a lot of empathy and they look out in the world and they say, you know, this is not okay. How do we have, you know, areas where people can communicate and share information and share value that are not under the thumb of one person who could be corrupted or one government or one whatever. So I love that people are trying to innovate on how we as humans can organize and control some of the most important information and value exchange networks in our lives. That's a really important question. I don't think we're going to escape the centuries of baggage of data that we know about, it's actually just really freaking hard to get people to all organize and read protocols and vote on them and do all the things that they're supposed to do. So we'll see whether it's actually some great panacea that solves everything. Probably not. Yeah. It, you know, it's going to, there are going to be pros and cons to all of it. So that that's my ramble on DAOs. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. So I, I I became a recognized delegate at, um, at MakerDAO like a month ago, and um, cool. I'll, I'll, I'm 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 you know I'm still excited about it. I don't want to bash it, but like I, I it's just been really fascinating seeing how it works. Uh, for example, like I have a recurring to do every single Monday now to look at the Monday proposals. So uh, this Monday I pulled it up. I've been out for like two weeks. Um, uh, or for like a week and a half and I pulled it up and I was like, there are three proposals. I have to vote on them as a recognized delegate. I don't really know what they're talking about. Like, I'm, <laughs> like, I'm not sure if this like liquidity pool on like osmosis with like U USDC on Cosmos into maker is a good idea, but like, I know I have to vote on it. And so then you're kind of just looking at like, all right, well, I'm going to look at what, what like Monet supply did and like Hasu and like, 
me go home because I'm going to look at these people and be like, well, they all voted yes. So, and I'm like, oh my God, this is so like, this is, we're not reinventing things here. This is so funny. So, yeah. So, yeah. I, just, I mean, it's a great, it's a great example, right? Um, that's a lot of time for you and a lot of energy. And you're like the mayor of this small town, really what you're, you're a representative of, right? Of MakerDAO. So you have to care about all this stuff and do this good yeah. work and are people going to vote for you will we have representative DAO democracy is going forward you know we need delegates or will we not right it's all it's going to be all the same questions and i think the principle is that we'll see a spectrum where the most important things in our life and the things that are the at most at risk of serious human issues if they are abused will get the most decentralized power structures possible because that, that's where it's worth the work because it's the most dangerous if something goes wrong. And so yeah. we will find people who will do it and people care about it. For everything else, we will end up using centralized and keeping it simple because it's simply not worth the overhead and the energy that decentralization takes. But there are a lot of things that are really important where that decentralization and that democracy and that is, is absolutely worth it. Everything else, yeah, I mean, for a game, like, come on, just enjoy the game, make decisions. It's like you, you were talking about like the, uh, the tech stack before. It's like, what's the society stack? It's like at the base layer, you have money. Uh, yeah. And then it, but like, a, like an application should not be decentralized. I think there's no reason for like an app to have a DAO, but a, like the protocol for money, like whatever you think of as Bitcoin, like I, that should be decentralized. And as you go up the stack, it gets less and less decentralized in my mind. Well, the app that could that could deserve it would be something like, a, you know, the future Facebook or Twitter, right, where now we're having people make decisions about censorship who are from one culture in one country. Right. Right. And so maybe that that oh, is an application hmm. that should be decentralized and people should, you should have a global user base who gets to vote on what yeah. they want. Or maybe that's a huge. Disaster. But maybe it's not the app. Like maybe it's not the app. Maybe it's the um. Maybe it's the. Maybe there needs to be a social protocol. Like it's not. And the protocol See? of social <laughs> should be decentralized. I don't know. I'm. I, I, I was. Uh, I'm biased because I talked to Stani for a while yesterday, and he was uh, shilling lens to me. So. I'm, uh, yeah. No, that's a great experiment. Yeah. Lens is a great experiment in how should we build these social utilities that's the thing is that twitter facebook instagram youtube whatever is they become like the whole town square idea they've become social utilities and there is a history of utilities these things that we cannot live without that are too important the grid whatever that become effectively decentralized democratized yeah. kind of run by you know someone else because they're too important for someone to mess up that could happen if you told me that that happens if, if you also told me that it was a total crapshoot mess to run that and so we just went the other way i would also believe you yeah um starting to think about wrapping it up i had a question on just like changing like just venture feels like it's changing like you guys changed your fund structure um to be more like you kind of broke the tradition um changed your fund structure to be able to hold public uh company equity i think was was the announcement back in like uh october november of 2021 uh you guys are now like holding or like more VCs are holding tokens. Um, and that just like turns, that turns VCs into hedge funds in a way, or maybe, maybe not hedge funds, but like companies or funds that have to make decisions about li completely liquid assets, um, whatever you want to call that. I'm, I'm just curious, like how that, how you see VC changing and like going in as, as this takes hold. Yeah. So I'll speak for Sequoia. So what's interesting that I really, a lot of people didn't realize about what we did was that, Sequoia has a lot of different pockets. So we've got our business that is, you know, the venture business backing founders of startups and private companies and growth. We also have had a hedge fund for a long time that's totally separate hmm. that just invests in public. But even the venture business, for as long as there's been Sequoia and there have been companies that IPO'd, we have had to make decisions about public stocks. So we have always had to make decisions about public liquid equities. The difference in what we did was there was this uh, time frame for funds that often constrained how long we could hold something because funds are raised in cycles. And so 
those LPs who invest expect liquidity at some point. Well, what would happen is we'd have to sell stock in an amazing company that we knew was Apple or something because we had to return liquidity, even though what would have been the better investing move would have been to hold that for as long as possible. Hmm. So what Sequoia did was restructure it so that we now have this long-term fund where we can graduate investments to that long-term fund. We can put public stocks there. And if there are LPs who want liquidity, they can sell their own shares out of that. But everyone else who's willing to stay long can stay long. And so we can also manage and we can, as managers, decide whether to sell or not from that. The point of that is that that will help us be better long term partners to founders, because the other problem that happens if you look at companies that IPO is that there are a lot of funds who immediately after the IPO, as soon as the lockup expires in the first year, all sell because they've been working with this company for 10 years and the LP wants it. So then the company that just went public, that's doing great. All of a sudden the stock is down 20% just because everyone is forced pressure selling to get liquidity to the LPs. So it has this negative effect on the founders we work with, even when Sequoia is still on the board, still working with them, still loves the company, would love to hold it for the next 50 years. Right. And so it's just this odd artifact of fund flows. And so Ruloff, so the senior steward of Sequoia, and many others led this effort to say we we should change this and be able to satisfy individual LPs desires for liquidity, but be able to be truly long term partners to founders where we can. Hmm. That's the goal. That's really interesting. How does token like in with equity investing, you might have you might be locked up for like 10 years because the company you invest in like 2007, it goes public in 2017. Like it's pretty long lockup. Um, how does that like how does token change that because even if there's like if you look at how a lot of these deals are structured you might have lockup but like it's like two years or like three years like yeah. does that does that hurt the founders or like what what is that how, yeah what's the impact of that yeah yeah it's a really interesting question i think i'm very curious how the launch of tokens the timing around that will change as crypto keeps growing i'm very curious whether we will see a trend to more and more companies waiting longer before they launch a token and have a yes, publicly 100%. traded asset. Yeah. Because I think, I think for some, again, it depends on what you're building. For some things, you literally have to do that, right? If it's a layer one, it's like, well, there's no, there's no way to secure it without that. So I got to launch it. But for others, I think there has been this excitement about it. And so there's this pressure to launch it quickly and get the excitement. But the downside is when it drops a lot, it affects employee morale, team morale. It affects, you know, other people and how they perceive your protocol. So I wonder whether we'll see people wait longer to launch that. And in that case, I think it just becomes very similar to the rest of tech investing where, you know, the question is, What's the best way to support the founders? Is it is it that the VC should sell and give liquidity to the market and allow more participants and users to have that? Or is it that they should keep going long and hold on with the founders and show faith? You know, it really depends yeah. on the situation. But my gut is that people will stop launching tokens right away as this knee-jerk reaction and instead become much more thoughtful about the right time to do it. I agree with you. I think that model of launching a token right away is a relic of the ICO. Boom where it was like, get the token, get a shit ton of money, and then like, and then go try to build something with that money. More and more, like the trend every year moves towards go build something amazing, then launch a token. Like what's what's the hottest hottest token of this year is going to be Arbitrum because they've already built an incredible tool yes. and an incredible yes. software platform, and then they will launch a token. Now the counter argument to that is like, well, doesn't that defeat the, a lot of the purpose of like giving retail the access and the token's gonna launch at some ridiculous FDV like, I don't know what it's going to be, 5 billion plus probably, which is just going to be crazy. Um, but yeah, I, I agree with you. I agree with you. Um, yeah. Michelle, if you weren't investing in, well, I know you do other investments. Like, what, what are you really interested in outside of crypto? And like, what are the most exciting areas for you? Yeah, I spend a lot of time thinking about data. I joke that actually crypto is the same. It's just all investing in databases. And blockchains are just databases and other databases. Um, I think... Data is one of the most interesting trends of the next uh, 
decade. I think, again, we've seen incredible innovation in the infrastructure layer, companies that Sequoia has been honored to work with, like Snowflake, uh, Confluent, MongoDB, you know, on and on, many others. And so we've seen the enterprise data stack fundamentally get a lot better. And now we're starting to see more companies think about how they can use that data as a competitive advantage. And some of that's through machine learning, some of it's through data science, um, but, and some of it will be applications. So I work with a company called Pilot, which is trying to use machine learning to automate bookkeeping. There's tons of examples. Mm -hmm. Some of it is the generative AI. How do we use data and machine learning to make fundamentally new things? Some of it is just automating inefficiencies. Some of it is go back to Netflix. How do I make my suggestions to you better? Well, I need that with a lot of data about what you like and what you use. I think data is one of the most interesting areas and I love the founders there. And the funny thing is people tend to think these worlds are really separate. The funny thing is I have so many crypto founders where we talk about crypto, but we also talk about crazy stuff in machine learning all the time. And there are a bunch of machine learning founders that Sequoia works with who have been deep in Ethereum, you know, yeah. for so long. The yeah. communities are way more similar than people realize. People interested in technology are interested in technology. They're interested in all of these things, right? So if you talk about the, some of the two biggest platform shifts, I think data and machine learning is one and crypto is another. And people are very interested in both of those. I think it, I think the one of the main similarities between both of those, honestly, I guess this is just all technology is like, it doesn't feel like it's taking off and it doesn't feel like it's getting traction until like yes. you wake up one day and it's here. And like, I, I just had that moment with, um, with Dolly, I've been reading yeah. about Dolly and like GBT3 for years, I feel like, and like machine totally. learning, reading about it for years. And then one day I woke up with 25% of Blockworks uh, images on our website are built by Dolly. It's oh, like, that's so cool. That's a really cool fact. Yeah. Um, and it just, and it just happened one, literally one week. It wasn't like we rolled yeah. it out. It's just one of our editors was like, can I use this? And I was like, sure. And they're amazing. They're like really yes. cool images. So yeah. Yeah. Totally. And that's the funny thing is I remember being in New York in 2017, I was working at McKinsey at the time and the two most horrible buzzwords that just give you chills that everyone was talking about were AI and blockchain. They were like AI and blockchain going to change the future. Yeah. And it was said so many places. I remember bus subway ads about it and you yeah. were just sick to your stomach hearing about it. Remember I, IBM was moving Walmart's blockchain onto the supply chain. And right? like, that was the whole thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> things that were just so painful and you're just sick of it but the thing is for the things that are real it just goes through these cycles of you know yeah. super cringe hype where you're just like stop talking about this this is insufferable to nobody cares and nobody believes and back up i mean it's really cyclical yeah. and volatile in both in both areas you know crypto you can track it with the tokens but it's kind of the same hype cycles definitely in in ai and, and in other areas yeah. Um, but I agree. Then, then you blink and one day, wait, there are actually 200 million holders of Bitcoin and Dolly images are everywhere. What happened? Yeah. yeah. I, in 2017, I was working at a data analytics company, uh, really interested in, and I was really interested in crypto. So I was basically the most cr cringe dinner guest that you could have. <laughs> so, yeah. Awesome. <laughs> Definitely don't invite you and me to the same dinner. So. <laughs> yeah, uh, Michelle, are we any are we missing anything? Anything that you really want to talk about? Any big big ideas that we, we haven't discussed here? This has been awesome. No, thank you so much for having me. This has been so much fun. Amazing. Well, thanks for coming on Empire. Um, and talk to you soon. Take care.